the lots of reasons behind that. One being that I was trying in trying to tell an African or an African influence sci-fi. Oh, I think somebody has your mic on. Okay. Um, yeah, instead of when in when in telling a, a African sort of fantasy story, I was also sort of following the rules of that kind of thing. I think for Western storytelling, there are a lot of things that um you know are endemic to Western storytelling. The idea of the hero, the idea that there is even the whole thing of the authentic version. You know, this is the true version. This is the authentic version. This is the director's cut. This is the this sort of obsession with authenticity and even truth, whatever that might mean. And in a lot of these stories, the stories change every day. The characters change every day. Um, you know, I remember growing up, my, it took me a while to realize that my grandfather was telling us the same story every night. He just changed one thing or, or something else. And... Um, and that, you know, that completely changed the perception of the story. The point being that the burden of truth wasn't with the story or the storyteller. The burden of truth is what you decide to believe. So the way this trilogy is working is I tell three different versions of a certain event. I'm not doing a part four where I say, oh, this is what really happened. So the, the, the reader is going to have to decide for themselves who was telling the truth because I'm not. It's never going to come from me. Um, the reader does have to pick sides. Or the, reader, or the reader decides that all of them are telling, you know, all of them are telling the truth. If you and I walk into a room and somebody's gobbling down a bag of chips, I might think, oh, my God, he's starving. You might think, oh, my God, he's gluttonous. Um, the facts of the situation, whatever that might mean, didn't change. Truth changed, though, because truth depends on a lot of things, including the subtext you're bringing the upbringing you're bringing, the prejudices you're bringing, um, the religion you're bringing to a simple story. You know, sacrifice to me is waste to you. So the, the, the great thing about this type of storytelling that I realized, and one of the reasons why I, I really wanted to write is something that, that plays on an African epic, is that I realized something that I didn't, I didn't know before, which was... Um, we like to think of the oral tradition back when stories were being told as some sort of cultural primitivity. And yet people who couldn't read and all they had to do was listen to stories still had a lot more that they had to define than we did. I think sometimes we approach literature like we want, we want pre-chewed food. Whereas with, in the oral tradition, I may very well be lying to you. You have to go through, you have to listen and play a role and make a decision in what is being said to you. Is it the truth? Do I accept this? Do I reject this? Or so on. It was a more involved way of, um, of being involved in a story, which is why for me, even now, it's very important to me that my stories, whatever I write, sound like they can be read aloud. And I think that's something that we forget when we're writing, because we're writing usually in a quiet space. A lot of us don't listen to music. <clears throat> I listen to death metal when I write. Me and Elif Shafak is crazy. She listens to the blackest black metal ever. I'm like, you crazy girl. Nobody would ever believe that. You're like a Turkish writer writing about Muslim life in, in, in Istanbul. Nobody believes that you're listening to Entombed. But, but that's what she does. And, I, and, and so on. It just this sort of, um, what, I guess, whatever you, it takes to get you into that room where you can write. Um, so I'm going to read, so I'm actually going to read from the new book. The first book in the trilogy is called Black Leopard, Red Wolf. Um, the second is called Moon Witch, Spider King. And you're the first people I'm reading from, reading this book from. So you're the first audience to hear anything from this novel. What do you need to know about this? So the Moon Witch, her name is Sogalan. And she is 177 years old. I think. Actually, I think she's 172. She has a way of, no, she's 177. And this is her remembering back when she was 13. 
And she's telling a story, but she's telling it in third person. She also is speaking in a language that's very close to pidgin, to Nigerian pidgin, or to how Wolof would sound. So it will sound some almost sort of like rural dialect. Or it will sound like in, in, in the way she speaks, there's rarely any present, any past tense verbs. Because in a lot of languages, including Jamaican dialect and, and a lot of Southern US black dialect, they don't use that there's no the verb is always present tense. It's different aspects of a sentence that change it. So Jamaicans, no Jamaican says he went. They say he did go. A person, you know, a, a person in, in, in the South would probably say he done gone. Nobody says he went. So so some of that, so just so so that's just a primer on the language, which may sound kind of foreign, because the other challenge of writing a novel set in a form of Africa, but using English languages, how can you make English sound not like English? So this is her, and this is her, she has just escaped her three very cruel brothers who had her living in a termite hill um, for reasons which you're going to have to read the book to find out. Um, so this is her. This is, she just escaped, and she's out in the wilderness, and... Uh, She's realizing maybe she made a mistake, even though living with her brothers was a nightmare. She says, and then there is more sun baking the skin and blinding the eye and a trail wide for two chariots and the numbness of feet walking too long, running from tree to tree and shed to shed and path to path and bush to bush until finally a forest to hide from her brothers who would surely be looking and asking others to look. Four days since shelter, two days since food, and one more noon before she fall. She can, she can feel sleep even though she's not dreaming. And when she's awake, she's moving though her legs are still. The rope was still tight. It was killing you like a snake, say a man's voice. But it belonged to a woman when, he, when she see her. Where your mother? The woman asked. And the girl nod over and over as if she got slapped out of a daze. One more day and the bones of the cart wake her up. The woman with the man voice now looked like a man and asked, where were you going, little girl? But the girl has no answer. No matter. They are going to Congor. See the girl. Year, jump over year, though sometimes it feels as if it jumped back. The woman from the cart is a woman with a house on a street where everything is blue. A house with two floors and two ladders and with two ladders and with two, ten women also. Women with the bewitching coup, the men call them. The woman from the cart who called herself Miss Azora called them her whores, for she was never one to hide behind pretty words. Says she about the girl, you've been growing through the years, but your face is too hard. Like all you can see are people who wronged you, and your chin too sharp, your eyes too deep, your nose too big, your titties too small, your legs too long, your hands too crafty, and your tongue is too quick. All this, and yet no other part of you even grow here yet. But the men, they keep coming, and they all say that lying between her is like lying on a cloud. That cloud is not between her legs, but the pillow on which all men fall asleep. Two nights after she first moved into the little room that they called the cupboard, one of the ten women climbed into her bed from a window above it. Call me Yanyu, she says. The woman look at the girl, sigh loud and long, then say, Don't mistake what Miss Azore is doing for charity. She only grooming you to be the next forbidden lily. Forbidden lilies for the man with peculiar needs, but nothing peculiar about these men other than a huge purse. The kind of man who see the friends his young daughter playing with and can barely control the lust to grab one and drag her to the back bush. But first she's going to wait, watch you grow a little, fatten you up a little more, then what she's going to do is this. One night, she'll just send a man in on you with no warning. she prefer it that way, to set them loose on you. Then explain afterwards that if you don't take to it, you can always leave. That is what she's going to do, for she do it to all of us. But this is what you can do, Yan Yu say. But she don't say a thing when a little girl asks what happened to the last woman they call Forbidden Lily. Instead, she slip her a pouch and say, mix only with as much as your fingertip in a mug and make sure they drink it. The fifth man was attacking her for long for as long as two songs humming before he, had to, he, sorry, before, he, before he went and took a drink. 
The men always wake up spent and proud, thinking surely they're leaving bastard twins inside her. After the fifth man, she starts robbing them. Her sack is getting full. Gold, silver, iron, cowries and ingots and earrings, nose rings, finger rings, necklaces, cola nuts, miracle berries, talisman, charms, a dried heart, animal bones, bower pieces, jade gemstones, wood fetishes, and a small figure cut from onyx. The man told his wife, it must have fallen out on the road, in the river, lost to sea, or got picked up from their robes. Far easier to let them go, even if they knew who took them. For the only thing worse than saying something precious was gone was to explain how it came back. They still come calling and ask for the girl with the cloud between her legs. Azura thought something, Miss Azura thought something strange for this little girl who was nowhere near a woman but didn't have anything about her to entrance a man. Certain things come to pass. It was Maganiti Jara, the 29th night of the Sikara moon. Men was doing what they feel they must do, and woman was making do. And at the house of Miss Azura, the mistress was cursing about a slow night. Most of them in the hall where Miss Azura greet the men and settle accounts. Miss Azura wondering, they say, I wish, I, they're saying we have nasty woman disease again, she asked, but nobody there could answer, for none of these women keep the company of women other than themselves. If man not coming to us, then we must go to the man, Miss Azura said, and ordered Yanyu to go out on the street and pull down her gown so that any man passing could see her. Why me, Miss Azura? Why you think, girl? Because I can't send Dinti out there, and I'm not asking you twice. Now go. Slow yet quick it happened. One long black finger wrapped around Miss Azara's neck, then two, then three, then four. Before any of the women scream, it grabbed Miss Azara, yank her off the floor and fling her into the wall across the room. Now the women scream and run. Nobody hear it coming nor see it or smell it either. Miss Azara don't move. Two steps in, one can see it is a male one, one that shrieks so loud that the woman ears all bleed. He looked like something that would move slow, but in a blink he grabs another woman trying to run and flings her away too. He scream again and mashes a chair. He, the thing. So high his head scraped the, the ceiling, one hand thin and weak uh, and looking, and the other thick as his body and touching the floor. He shift and scramble like a spider, slamming his big hand down and smashing tables and urns and vases. Then he see the girl and shriek again. He goes straight for Sogolon and she scream. She climb the ladder fast, but never climb anything but she never climbed anything so fast and run to her cupboard. The smashing, the shrieking, the screaming all some downstairs until her little door is torn off. The beast scrambling right, in right over her. The girl is shaking so hard that each blink scatters tears. Better thank the gods you're not a boy thief or I'd be calling 10 men to pull him out of your asshole, she said. She, a woman looking like somebody of great nobility and importance. Her dark lips and wide nose in a frown her annoyed eyebrows sitting below a pattern of white dots that run down her left cheek. An Igea on her head, like a large black flower, and a long white blanket around her shoulders with the black pattern of a warrior with spear and shield. A tall woman, and wide though she was not fat. She looked like she could hold all her children at once. Cheeks of a woman who laughed without warning, without joke. The little girl is still trembling. Where is it, girl? The girl couldn't get out the words. Where, where? The talisman, little fool. My little figure in onyx. Don't let me ask you for it again, or I will let him search you. The ukundunka, for that is what it is, lowered his head right in front of her, a head long like a horse, eyes like a wolf, teeth like a crocodile, breath like she didn't know. They are one, you understand me? The ukundunga and the talisman, they are one. Let me tell you a story. Once after we long married, I said to my husband, Dearest husband, everybody know you're an important man. Everybody know that it's important business that keep you out late at night. The gods know how I worry. I worry so much that I ask a conjurer spirit to make something to keep my husband safe. Yes, husband, I say, you carry this talisman and the ukundunka will protect you. An important man like you with enemies everywhere, why, you could be in a ditch. So every night I flip the hour glass more than five times, and if there's no sign of my husband, I send this thing searching for him. To keep him safe, you understand me? Lo, one night he not only come home late, but he come home without it. Lost it, he say. 
He said, don't bother to find it, for I don't know where it's gone. And I said, don't worry, husband. I soon find it and deal with who take it. Now look at where it resting in the bosom of a whore. I'm not a whore. You're in a whorehouse. Uh, it's not good that you're a nun. I'm not a whore. You're not a cook. I am not a whore, oh. Then why you smell of men? The little girl had no answer. She could have said that, yes, the room stunk of men, but none of that stink was on her. But talking of sleeping poison would lead to Mrs. Zaro finding out. The noble woman eyed her deep, inspecting her. Maybe you can give him a child. I certainly not about to suffer one. Certainly not with him. <laughs> Look at the shock on your face. You really are a child. I, I never whore. I never whore with none of them. I robbed them. The little girl is more disturbed by the woman's stare than by the Okundunka's hiss. But then her frown breaks into a smile. Gold, cowrie, money notes, talk to me, girl. The little girl can do nothing but stare at her again. She wonders if this is what grown women do. Unveil and unveil, surprise and surprise. So much so that the only thing one can expect from a woman is wonder. I take whatever... I I take whatever they have that, that shouldn't be hanging loose, and I keep it for myself. For Mr. Zara don't give us nothing. Nothing at all. Your clothes? She buy, we buy it. She don't give us nothing except for one thing. She give, us all, she give all of us a rape the first time she sell us and charge the man triple money. So I mix them a potion, which made them sleep, and then I robbed them. Huh. So they take nothing from you, but you take plenty from them. See here, girl, you in the wrong house. I'm not leaving one user for another. Who say you even have use? The little girl leave with the noble woman that night. Mr. Zora say nothing. Mr. Zora don't move from the spot where the Okundunka threw her. So who knows what was the fate of that woman? The noble woman asked the little girl her name. I don't have none. What? What do people call you? Little one, little dung, little girl, little whore, little shit, forbidden lily. Enough. You choose a name and that is what we will call you. I call my mother Sogolon. See the girl take her mother's name, her dead mother's name, 170 and 70 years ago. 170 and 7 times since that this great god of the world spin around the sun. Sogolon. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was wonderful. Everybody give it up. <laughs> um, it was a real pleasure to hear uh, to hear all those delicious verbs in the in the action sequence. <laughs> um, as they've been talking about endlessly in our workshop now. Mm -hmm. um, what about verbs? Verbs, action, dialogue. Uh, mm -hmm. How much of uh, how much of the story is is moved on that? Yeah, <clears throat> I think uh, I thought we'd open up, maybe talk a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, Fifteen minutes. Ago, open it up for general discussions uh, mm -hmm. and questions from there. Um, so I was thinking about you know these strange times we're living in and how. Uh, the genres we're writing fits into all of that. And I mm -hmm. wonder, what do you think about, um, you know, co COVID, social awakenings, and uh, speculative fiction? What's the, uh, are you glad you're working mm -hmm. in fantasy now, or do you wish you were uh, in the modern world somehow? Um, it's probably a combination of both. You know, I mean, fantasy was the original dystopian fiction. Uh, the, the, you could call The Last Man the first true sci-fi novel. Mm -hmm. And that was Mary Shelley. That was around the time of Frankenstein. And um, the, 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 the times that they're being, you know, we need people who are brave enough to speculate what happens if this time goes too far or if the time doesn't go far enough. And that's what our speculators have always been doing. It's one of the things that I, I really, really like about, say, Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale is under a really, really, has a really, really simple premise in it, which is basically, what if men overcame all their differences to decide that we should all just get together to oppress women? And it sounds almost preposterous that, that it could happen, except it happened before. You know, I was watching this documentary on the Playboy Club, 
And they're trying to make this whole thing about how Hugh Hefner was such a, a revolutionary because there were black men in the Playboy Club. And it was so open to race. But every woman had a bunny on her butt, a bunny tail on her butt. So the whole idea that Margaret was saying that men will come together to oppress women. Yeah, yeah, it's happening. Um, you know, the other thing, it's funny, I actually have lots of things about Handmaid's Tale. Um, you know, people wonder, for example, how could something like that happen? And, you know, I come out of evangelical church. I'm surrounded by the people who are actively working to make that happen. Yeah. They, they, they can't watch behind me until they feel they're being found out. <laughs> uh, so it's, um, what am I saying about all of this? I'm saying that it's, it's two things. I think our, our um, sci-fi and our fantasy people, our fantabulous are sometimes examining what happens, what are the consequences, and it's not always bad, but what are the consequences of the way in which we're seeing the world now? Like some people are actually writing great things. Like what are the consequences of us finally getting over our bullshit about identity and trans and non-binariness? Mm. I mean, you know, um, Delaney already did that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so some of it is, uh, it can also be an exploration of how good we can be and how, how where, where our society can go. Um, I think in this, in terms of this, you know, this epidemic, um, I don't know. It depends because if you look at it in terms of the politics of the epidemic, it's a kind of a disgrace. You know, <laughs> um, it's it's. Um, I think it's 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 interesting. You know, uh, the one of the types of um, fiction that we sometimes that sometimes fall out of readership and i'm looking talking about particularly speculative fiction is the idea that the post post apocalypse can just come out of nowhere or post apocalypse can be a disease you know we all think post apocalypse is some madman pushing the red button which he may still do but <laughs> but it's 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 also you know um a sign of, of what happens when we are, when, when, you know, just the aspects of our own, you know, our own sort of nature. Um, uh, yeah. At the same time, I think there, you know, fiction, I mean, fiction is a really good tool. Fiction, nonfiction, poetry, literature in general um, is a great tool to try to sort of make sense of the world we're in. And, you know, it's something that, that, um, you know, it's something that, 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 you know, a news report can't necessarily do. And I think, um, cause I know I'm presently doing it. I'm trying to figure out how did people, how did people respond to things before like 1918 flu plague? And I've been going back to fiction and novels. Um, you know, I just bought journal of a plague year, you know, Daniel Defoe's book about, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of nonfiction, but it's, it's, those are the things we go back to to try to understand these times because I think you know that we, that's something that we still depend on our literature for. Where do you think fantasy falls in all of that? I think some some react to it as a kind of escapism, mm -hmm. um, and then there, I think there's another school of thought that sees a kind of logical language in a fantasy where you can maybe explore things without. Mm -hmm. uh, in your own setting and on its own terms. Uh, mm -hmm. Is fantasy more escape for you? Or uh, that favorite? Mm -hmm. Hold on one second. Max, I'm in a class. Sorry. For such a small dog, he is really demanding. One second. Come here. Okay, then stay there. Anyway. <laughs> um. I think it's 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 both. I um, it's certainly an escape writing it. Um, you know, it's uh, I think one of the reasons why I've been writing so much is that it's that thing you know that, that thing Tara Tempest Williams said. You know, she writes, I write so I can have more than one life. Yeah. And um, right now I'm writing fantasy uh, because I want to have more than one life, and I want to have a life that is in some ways very, very different from here. But I think we also, 
really, really interested in seeing what happens to human nature when we put it in a different scenario. Uh, what happens to human nature when we put it on a spaceship? It's about it's, it's, it's as valid a question as what happens to human nature when you put a, a bunch of, of schoolboys on a, a remote island. Yeah, or you wake up tomorrow morning and everybody in the world is blind but you. It's um, it's because those are it's asking big questions. It's, it's these big scenarios that are asking actually really simple questions, which is how do we behave as people, and what do we how do we treat each other when we're faced with different circumstances? And I think sci-fi speculation and and all form of literature is speculation of one sort. Even what Karlov Nosgar does is speculation, um, but it's it's a way of 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 um answering questions and putting people in situations that maybe you want to know how we react and how we how we behave um it's really interesting writing about a 13 year old girl who's living 177 years from a time which is 400 years ago <laughs> and remember you know certain things and and um the things they get right and the things they don't and 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 so on but i find myself still asking questions like well how does a person be yeah um and I think, you know, you know, I'm going to send you to your room. <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's, it's particularly um, that kind of stuff. And I don't want to talk, it's only speculative because a lot of us are not writing sci-fi and speculative um, fiction, but we are imagining worlds and we are putting ourselves in situations, you know, um, you know we, we are, for better word, we are speculating. And I think... Um, it's that it's it's we're curious as to see how how people behave and how people behave in situations and what does it tell us about ourselves um, when when they're put in those kind of, of scenarios. Sci-fi can also be allegory. Yeah. Um, a lot of times it's allegory for what's going on. Um, you know, a lot of times it's not. A lot of times it's simply just I just wanted to show just how much human nature hasn't changed. You know, Margaret Atwood says human nature hasn't changed in a thousand years. And if you want to know how, why, just check the mythologies. Yeah. And, um, and I think that's it. For me, for me, um, fantasy, this kind of, certainly the kind of fantasy that I'm writing, which is not just fantasy, but it's also me trying to reconnect with an African, uh, and by Africa to be in a sort of a central, West Central Sahel region, Africa, um, mythology that I didn't grow up with. I grew up with folklore. I grew up with mythology. Those are very, they're, 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 they're connected, but they're different. You know, um, brother, brother, brother rabbit is folklore. You know, Zeus Aphrodite is mythology. Um, and uh, the folklore without the mythology behind it can open up to a lot of things. One, you don't, you, you don't get what mythology is for. Mm. And you don't get the bigger reason why you need a brother rabbit. And the bigger reason why you need an Anansi. Mm -hmm. Or the bigger reason why there's a Snow White. Yeah, and um, me right, and I wrote these novels to, to to tap into, you know, the mythologies. The thing about mythologies you know, is that um, I was it's funny, I just wrote a I wrote an intro to Neil Gaiman's Neil Gaiman has a book of of a collection of his stories, and I just wrote an intro for it. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I said in it is that you know, mythologies were religions once. Mm -hmm. You know. And before that, they were real before that. So it's not like people were like, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to pray to, to Aphrodite until, until Jesus comes along. Even if that's what happened. It's like, no, Aphrodite is real. She used to be here, but now she's not. And I'm praying to her. It's the reality of the time. And, and also, I think that's one of the reasons why I, I, I both sort of accept and kind of reject the fantasy label. I accept it because I love fantasy and I still read it probably more than most other genres. Mm -hmm. um, reject in a sense that if I were to hand this to somebody from the time period I'm writing, they'd go, where is the magic? Mm -hmm. They go, where is the fantasy? You know, if somebody grows up in, in straight up Orisha worship, um, you know, part of the Yoruba nation and I give them 100 years of solitude, they go, where is the magic? Yeah, it's not magical realism, it's real. Uh, which is something Marquez was trying to tell us. Yeah, so it's, uh, so, you know, so that plays a, a role in it too, that um, a huge part of the, the role that 
speculative plays is that some of it is not speculation at all. That some of it is not fantasy. It's just another way of talking about, you know, reality, I think. I wonder if you found at all that it's hard for a modern audience to, to wrap its head around the way people were, were wired when it came to storytelling, you know, maybe a thousand years ago. And the idea of fantasy, sometimes now, fantasy is like synonymous with having a, a, a map, a, a key, a, you know, a system of magic. It's, very, it's, it's really a technology in a lot of the ways it exists. Mm -hmm. you sort of rationalize it and say, well, you cast this spell and do this thing. Um, I wonder if there isn't some tension in the, in the audience, the readership, being able to, you know, kind of take that trip. And, and see what the way, you know, your characters are wired where the, mm -hmm. you know, the belief in a magical occurrence was as, vi as, as, as viable as, you know. Well, I think, I think it, it's, uh, some of that is our idea of what exactly is a leap when it comes to the imagination. I find realistic fiction re um, thoroughly preposterous most yeah. of the times. Exactly. You know, I'm like, so you live in, you live in one of the three Portlands you live there all this time. You have no black friend. Nobody of any other color but white lives there. You have, you are 200 pounds overweight, but some of the hottest women are all having affairs with you. <laughs> and you're so conflicted about it. Um, I was like, come on, that's as preposterous, that's as, preposterous as Buck Rogers. Uh, it's, it's, it's on one level. I, I absolutely love Updike, but Updike is as preposterous as Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Sorry if anybody Updike think that they're, they, oh, they're really, if, if, if the Updikes of this world really think, you know, that Megan Fox is just waiting for that moment when you show up with your fishing rod. And we're going to have lots of kids in Maine while I cheat on you with somebody hotter when I hit 50. No. <laughs> It's, it's, but for some reason, and I'm not knocking that because I adore Updike, but the idea that that is somehow closer to the lived experience than Buffy the Vampire Slayer is actually kind of ludicrous. Yeah. And, um, and nobody from 400 years ago would have thought that. Um, nobody connected to the mythologies would have thought that because in a lot of ways, the mythologies were sort of the emotional history of a people. Um, it's one of the things that I love about American gods. Yeah, uh, the the idea that no, these gods didn't leave. They just no longer. They're just no longer listened to. Yeah. That it's it's um it's all it's all speculation. It's all the thing I used to love about Buffy when I was in when 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 I was a big Buffy devotee in the nineties. You're either Team Buffy or Team Felicity. I hated Felicity. I couldn't stand that show. I like it now, but I couldn't stand it. But, and, and, and the thing is, the thing about a, a show like Buffy is that because of the vampires, because of the werewolves, because of the witches, it had no choice but to deal with gut truths. It had no choice because, you, because if, you, if, you, if you made the emotional life of the story as, as fantas fantastical as a werewolf, then the, show is, then, then the show is terrible. It had no choice but to make her grounded. So, so when... Buffy sleeps with Angel and he goes back to being a big vampire and he kills nearly everybody she loves. On one hand, that is a wild fantasy. But on the other hand, it's the, it's, it, it, it taps into one of the sheer fears of adolescence, which is, is this guy who I am, who I am really opening myself up to going to hurt me? Um, it's, it's right there in that song, Will You Love Me Tomorrow? It's the, and, 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 and there are so and there and there are TV shows that try to be realistic about teenage life that never nail it mm. as accurately as that show where they're they're you know they're killing vampires with wooden stakes. So it's it's um I think it's it's we kind of have to sort of open up ourselves. I mean I remember back back in the nineties everybody was trying to convince that the West Wing is a good show. And it's a good type of show. Um, but no, it's, it's the, 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 the truths about my, ad, you know, my adolescence and growing up was from a show with vampires in it. I think it just means we have to have a broader idea of what literature can do and what you can do as a writer. Because what I find sometimes, and this is not just, again, even though, you know, the reason why me and Theo are talking about fantasy is that because we're nerds and we can't help ourselves. Um, but 
what regardless of what the story is, what I find too often with writers is that there is a story that's in their head. And there's a story that comes down on the page and it's not the same story. Mm. And, it's, and so, and it, listen, it's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. It took me years. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take a while for you to trust that the story in your head is the one that should come down on the page. Because mm. so many things happen. One of the worst things that can happen to you is having an idea about what your story should be. The only person who has an idea what a story should be is the story. <coughs> and there are times where you're going to be in a situation, because I, well, maybe not, it happened with me, where I was in a fight with my own story. Because there's this kind of idea, and you know it's what you want to do, but you don't think it's going to sell, or you don't think somebody's going to read it, or you don't think somebody's going to believe it, or you don't think these characters are who you want people to know you for, or you just don't want to enter that territory and have, watch, have people know that you did it. And what happens is then you write the failure of nerve story, which can also be a good story. You know, you write the tentative story, which can actually be a good story, but it's not the story that is, con it, it doesn't have any electricity. It's yeah. not connected to the thing that you know is in your head and that needs to come down, you know, on the page. That's not to say when it comes down, it's perfect. Actually, when it comes down, it will probably be trash. And that's exactly what you want it to be, you know, because that's, that's just the first step. Because then you have, you know, I mean, my, my um, brief history, seven killings. So I was looking back at the draft that got printed. It was draft 9B. So not even draft 9A got printed. It was draft 9B. Uh, so it's, it's it, but it's, um, and a huge, re what, and, and a major part of that was me, you know, stop trying, you know, trying to stop second guessing myself. There are parts of the novel where I wrote where, man, we are so off topic. There are parts of the novel I wrote where um, I said, you know, you know what? I'm just going to leave it until my editor said takes it, take it out. Because I was that afraid of what I wrote. And uh, a lot of them, he didn't. He's like, no, I don't want you to take that out. I want you to take out this boring part here. I was like, oh, I thought that's what people wanted to read. I'm like, nobody wants to read that. <laughs> <laughs> they've already read it yeah and and that's what you know that's what the, the and, and and i mean that's what happening so i'm saying that all so I, to me it's, it's very important that people realize all literature is speculation yeah. and that's what's great about it yeah well well said um yeah i think i think just to you know make it a little more all over the place why don't we open up for some questions mm -hmm. and uh, see where the community takes us here um and i'm gonna eat a cough drop because i've been talking all week uh okay i've got one here from lisa m Barr. how do you feel about people not of a particular culture writing in that culture's voice is it that, appreciation or appropriation is it what or appropriation appreciation, yeah. appreciation or, or, um i i have a feeling it's neither i think it's observation and investigation and I think if you're if if you're if you are smart and you do your work, it can stop there and you still end up with something interesting. Otherwise, journalism couldn't work. What? But what you want to do though is go a little step further than that. I mean, Jonathan Franzen to me stops at observation, hmm. and he will say that. Hmm. People ask, "How do you write these car these women characters? They seem so fully realized." It's like I don't realize anybody. I don't empathize with anybody. I just observe. And he's a fantastic observer. V.S. Naipaul was a great observer too. Um, no surprise, they're horrible people. Well, I don't know Jonathan Franzen. I can't call him horrible, but Naipaul was a flipping monster. But Naipaul could walk into a room and better than any writer alive, he can walk into a room, sum it up, go home and write an essay, and he nails it. Because his story on, on the Middle Passage, his book, The Middle Passage, to even though it's about 1962 Jamaica, and I go, God damn it. I hate that you're right. But is observation enough? You know, because one could say that a lot of these characters, a lot of Naipaul's characters, a lot of J.M. Kutsia's characters, they're well drawn, but you couldn't care less if they live or die. You know, um, I remember when I finished reading The Corrections, I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant book. 
And to this day, I am so happy that I will never see those characters again. Mm. I will never reread that book because I don't want to be in that, I don't want to be in a room with those people ever. <laughs> Which I guess is testimony to a kind of brilliance, right? But I think we have to go one step further. I think we have to go, we have to risk empathy. I think we have to try. And, and, uh, and anybody has seen me just go for, scroll three pages of me on Facebook, you can see how anti-empathy I am. Be not because I think it's impossible. I think people look at it in all sorts of wrong ways. Um, so to come back to the, to the question, I, 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 I don't think it's an appropriation question when it comes to literature. Because all literature is about the other. Somebody asked um, Anna Devere Smith that question. And she's like, have you seen my entire life? My entire career is jumping into other people who are not me. It's do the work. It's do the work. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not an inspiration. It's not, um, you know, it's not like, um, you know, trying to, 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 to live that life. Sometimes it's just listening. I think, you know, what, you know what it is when I want people to write about the other, I actually don't steer them towards fiction. I actually steer them to some nonfiction. I just got, I just say, you know what, just put this in your mind. What would Boo do? Boo being Catherine Boo, who wrote Behind, Behind the Beautiful Flowers. Is it Beautiful Flowers? Her book about Mumbai. Mm. Um, White American Journalist is one of the best books about India I've ever written. Beautiful Forevers, Behind the Beautiful yes. Forevers. Thank yeah. you, Behind the Beautiful Forevers. It's one of the best, absolute best books in the ever and certainly one of the best pieces of journalism ever. Yeah. Because she did the work. And, um, and I think she, there's some, there are some um, interviews that are online and she talks about it. She was like, in a lot of ways, it was more important for me to do the work than to like the people or to or have the people to like me. And I think we have to do what Grace Bailey said we should do, which is to get under the rock of a person's character. So my, my answer is anybody can write anybody, but it's also the quickest way to fail. But I know white men who, write, white men who suck at writing white men. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's always this moment in class where I'm having this argument with a writer in my mind. I'm like, but you are a black woman. How could you not get this right? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's um, I think it's doing the work, and I think it's recognizing humanity. And I think what I what I find sometimes it still happens is we're still writing these noble savages. Mm. We think if we make the character likable, or if we make the character nice, it's like no, the character don't have to be nice. The character just needs to be real. The character needs to be. We need to get the sense, and it's not hard to make a character three-dimensional. It's not hard. You know, if you are giving me, open the scene, we're in a trailer park. You're already giving me a ton of information. The people in the trailer park are white. You're giving me a lot of information. I know where you're going. We follow the woman. Her name is, I don't know, Caitlin. Caitlin got three kids. We open the door to the trailer park. And right on the top is, you know, right on, and right on the top of it, right there is war and peace, clearly being read. Hmm. Suddenly our character is complicated. Yeah. Car Caitlin may not even have shown up yet, but we're already having these conflicting ideas, trailer park, Tolstoy, trailer park, Tolstoy, what's going on? And they, this sort of one dimensional thing that we could have built on is no longer possible because we have complicated the character and i think that's one that's what you know that's what we you do you, you, you do the research and you complicate the character and you listen to people i am yeah. far more forgiving of a three-dimensional character where the accent is off than a caricature from somebody who thinks they know ebonics and i think that's it it's it's you, you, you can't we, we can't be as writers fearing you know, writing about the so-called other the first thing is that there is no other mm. and that's the first thing you have to realize and 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 bring that into into your writing and that doesn't just apply I, I think people i think sometimes with this conversation because writing the so-called other is dangerous people think writing people like them is safe mm. it's like no it's not 
I don't care if you knew your mother all your life. If you're going to write a biography of her, you have to do the research. You know, I don't care if you're writing about a character who's exactly like you in a veiled autobiography. You have to do the research. That's why I believe Carlo Vinazgar, when he says it's a novel that he's written, he hasn't written nonfiction. Because yeah. he has to do the research and he has to interrogate himself on a way in which you'd be uneasy doing if he was talking to you. Yeah. And I think that's it. That's, you know, my students will say, they're so sick and tired of me saying that. Every week I say it interrogate it interrogate it it's like yeah this is nice interrogate it it's like this is not enough interrogate it yeah. and then you do it i wonder just as a follow-up if if part of this conversation gets uh in the it's what is essentially a we have an artistic aesthetic literary conversation and the social question of who mm -hmm. profits off of these stories who gets right. to take the credit who gets to uh, you know, have a legacy and that there's, you know, there's some resistance and some awareness maybe that, um, you know, I don't know, it does seem like, at least online, the question of whether something's done well, sometimes isn't even addressed. It's, mm -hmm. it's the kind of like, well, you're not this person, you're telling the story and you're profiting from it. And yeah, and I, and I have a big, and I, and, and, and I, I just, I, I'm so exhausted with that argument. I had a, somebody sent me a letter um, a few months ago, a uh, uh, Hawaiian, Hawaiian American um, re reviewer wanted me to, wanted to interrogate me because I, I blurb Kawhi Strong Washburn's novel. And, um, and as soon as I said that, the, name, the novel went out of my head. What is wrong with me today? Anyway, <laughs> Kawhi's novel. You've and he a, heard, huh? You've gotten a bunch right. Don't worry. Uh, and he heard that Kawhi is not Kawhi is not Hawaiian. He's an African American born to a Hawaiian mother and a and a, and a and an American soldier, and he's not a real Hawaiian. And I'm very he's very upset about it. And did you know this when you blurb this book and blah blah blah? And I think you know honestly, I really don't give a shit about this argument anymore. Mm. I was like, I mean, he was born in Hawaii. Mm. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know what else is a Hawaiian past. And, and, and if there is, that's an argument I am no longer interested in having. Fair enough. That said, that said, um, you know, the first article I ever published was an article called, uh, called When You're Not White Enough to Write a Black Novel. Mm. You know, um, which was me talking about trying to get my first novel published, which nobody wanted. And um, at one point, me and my friend Gerard, who's a white photographer, photographer from Australia, we're going to hatch a plan where I was going to send resend out the book with his picture. And I kind of still regret that I didn't do it. <laughs> I probably should have done it. I might do it still one day. <laughs> um. Yeah, but you know what? I mean, I I, it, 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 I think it's still I think it's still hard. I think it's still there's still every now and then this this reflex where the white guy writing the quote unquote exotic will still get an ear that the person from that culture where it's not exotic at all, it's real life, will not. I think things are different. I think it's a very big deal that two black women just took over as heads of two of the most, the biggest publishing houses in the country. Um, you know, I think that's a, and I'm not just blowing a horn because Lisa is my friend, but um, I think it's a very big deal. I also think I've been in this industry long enough to know that the kind of books I'm publishing now would never have found a publisher when I started out. You know, I remember once when I, I, got into the first time people tried to cancel me when I was said, I said, you know, writers of color feel they have to pander to the white woman or the white woman reader. And a lot of people were upset with that until I showed white women how they have to also pander to this so-called white woman reader. There's no such person, you know, Rob Foreman do who died this year. We got in and, and we had a very, we got into a big argument until I showed her, she had a novel called Being Polite to Hitler, which to me is one of the greatest titles ever. And the editor in America wanted to change it to The Garden. 
And I said, who's that pandering to? That's pandering to an idea of a certain kind of reader. She's white, she's suburban, she doesn't want no trouble. I was like, that's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, you know, many white women read my books. I was like, <laughs> and some sick shit happens in them sometimes. Um, but the idea that um, there is this kind of reader is something that the publishing industry still needs to come to terms to and still need to get get behind. I think they've come a long way, as I said, but um, there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah. Uh, okay, we got a, one question from uh, Chantez, new, new uh, MFA student. Um, Hi, Chantez. Yeah, this should be interesting. Uh, question here, how many subplots do you think is too much for a novel and why? <laughs> you can't ask a person who have 900 page manuscripts that kind of question. <laughs> oh my God, wow. <laughs> Even Max didn't like that question. Actually, it's a great question. <laughs> great question. Thank you, sir. Max, stop barking. I'm trying to be profound here. Ah, small dogs, really. It's not even my dog. Um, I think subplots, it's, it's, well, the first question is, have you lost track? <laughs> Because if you've lost track, then there, there may be a problem. The second question is, how are you juggling them? Like, um, one second, I'm gonna, come here, come here, dog. Stop. <laughs> I think he's just, I think he's just hearing other dogs. Here's a carrot. Um, I'm so American. I say things like carrot. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's, it's what, it's how manageable they are. There are a couple of things about multiple plots. Cause I do write stories that have tend to have tons of plots and tons of, of subplots. It's one, it's how you're sort of managing the stories together. Sometimes that might mean what I do, which is we put a chart. And, um, and actually line up all the storylines and sort of write them down. And then you can start to see how, it's, how they work together. Is there um, a correlation happening or is there too much going on? The other thing that may happen with, with subplots is one reason why they, may be, may be, um, why they may be confusing is that they're all, they're all happening at the same time and they're all being resolved at the same time. Some plot lines finish on a page. Some are going to go on for 20 pages. Some are going to go on to the end of the very last line of the book. So it's, trying, it's, it's figuring out which, and all of them have to have their beginning, middle, and end. So it's figuring out where these, you know, what's the, where in the grand sort of art, grand setup of the, of the book do these storylines, um, you know, occur. But um, the other thing is, you know, if, if I did this once, and it's a it's a brutal thing to do, but you know sometimes you got to do it. Where I print out my stories on double sided paper, and without fail, a good percentage of those pages I forget to read. <laughs> and if I forget to read them and everything was cool, I usually just cross them out. <laughs> so I, you know, if it was moving quite fine, eh, eh, get rid of it. Um. Yeah, so yeah, I think on one hand, don't be scared of ambition. But I think on. <laughs> thank God. Go. Hold on. Hi, Dan. Sorry. I am. Oh, sorry. I'm literally teaching a class. <laughs> Max! Hmm? Yeah. Okay, I'll come around there soon. You know what? We'll just let him bark. <laughs> right. All right. Hopefully, he's... is everybody hearing him bark? Is it a loud bark? Yeah, it's not. It's kind of cute. Okay. We'll just leave him then. Um, you know what? Oh, noise canceling. I forgot I have noise canceling headphones. There we go. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. So it's, it's, one is if can you keep track of them? It's also, sometimes it's not necessarily a, uh, uh, um, subplot problem as a character problem. Are too many characters 
mm. getting too much um, of the story. And I think sometimes, especially when we're, we're, we're writing a novel, um, we don't want to leave a character behind. And sometimes we kind of have to do. Um, or there, you, you work out the sequence in which they appear. Some characters are appearing too early. Some may be appearing too late. Like a character, you know, it's, it's, especially when I just started out writing novels, I wanted everybody every, all the time. It was a, 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 one of the characters in Brief History started out on page one until I realized he's supposed to be on page 438. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> and that's what happened. It's, 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 um, just sort of, yeah, going back through it and just thinking how many P characters can you manage? Don't think about plot line and, and so on first. Think of how many characters you can manage at a one, a one point and then take it from there. It's always, so the, 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 the thing about creative writing, a lot of times the way we diagnose a problem is not the way we think the problem is. A lot of times when we think we have a problem with, with um, plot lines, what we're really having a problem with is character. A lot of times when we think we have a, pro a, char a problem with character, what we're really having a problem with is atmosphere or sometimes. You know, so, um, and sometimes that's how you go about it and you figure out um, what's wrong. So I would say, don't look at the plot, look at the characters and see which characters do you really want to be with at this section and who can wait. Sounds good advice. Yeah. Um, I have a question here is from uh, Brandon A. Jackson. Hi, Brandon. Um, Hey, Brandon. He's kind of interesting. He's asking about world building versus story. Ah. Uh, I thought it's kind of interesting just because, you know, you look at, you know, the, uh, you know, can a world exist without the story? To what extent is it, does it even matter? And how, mm -hmm. and how much of this and how much, you know, especially as fantasy nerds, do we overindulge mm -hmm. in a world that is not, you know, connected to a story? That is, you know, if, 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 there's, if there's ever a major conflict, particularly with, it's not just a fantasy and a sci-fi person, the historical fiction person sometimes run into it too. Um, the world building versus the story. Sometimes we have to have, sometimes this is the part where we have to accept some gut truths that sometimes we're really here for the world building. And, and uh, you know, oh man, it was, it was, it was an awkward day when I was trying to convince my friend, I think this is a video game scenario. I don't think this is a novel. I'm sure he's making more money than me now, but <laughs> he didn't want to hear it then. Um, it's, it's, I think, you know, world building, and, and it's funny because I'm a big world builder and I spend years doing it. Um, you know, the, the, the first time I started thinking about Black Leopard Red Wolf was the summer before, 2000, summer of 2015, which means I was still pretty knee deep in brief history. The Booker Prize hadn't happened yet. Nothing happened. And, but, and, I, and between 2015 and probably 2017, I was just world building. Hmm. Um, and, 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 but I was also falling into traps that world builders fall into, which is you get so convinced, so concerned with the world, you forget that stories are is it ultimately about people and about conflict. And one way in which to solve this, I think, is to, if you're going to world build, then role play. Mm. If you're going to world build, fine but drop yourself into the world drop the characters into the world and have them move through it as if the world is already there and aspects of the world will appear to you as you need them because if we do it the other way where you just keep building 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 you're going to find that you're more interested in the world than the characters and even when the characters show up it's going to reflect that so you end up like a world, a, a, an expert world builder who didn't give a car about characters much, H.P. Lovecraft. Um, I got a lot of good things to say about him. I have more bad things. But, um, you know, part of uh, Lovecraft's problem is that he just didn't like people, right. particularly people who are not white. Um, but that, that, that comes back to haunt him in a sense that just about nobody who gets from Lovecraft and, and everybody, including Neil Gaiman, gets tons from Lovecraft. Nobody ever says, I got my sense of character and conflict from Lovecraft. Of course not, because there are none there. Um, yeah, it's, it's, which is, I mean, fine. His, his worlds and his, his plot lines are enough. 
But I think that eventually, whatever world you're building, the world becomes interesting when people are in it. Um, otherwise, you're spending a very long time on setting, and setting is crucial, and setting is character, and setting is time, and setting is place. But you have to think about who are the people in this world who make you want to stay there? Because you can have a, again, as I said, the, one of the quickest ways to move from world building is to drop yourself into the world you're building. Space is nice and until you realize you're the only person in space. You know, Middle Earth is great, but you're the only one here. <laughs> then you see how quickly you want, okay, let's bring some characters into this shit. <laughs> um, and I think that's it. It's, 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 um, it sounds weird. I, when I tell people the best way to, to get out of world building into story building is to go even more into it. You think I'd say go less into it. No, go more into it. Plunge yourself into the world and see what people are doing there. Because I actually, I still believe you don't create stories. I, I think you find them. And, and yeah, jump in there and go, you know, that person who just passed by on a white horse, what's their problem? Right. All right. Um, and, 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 and follow it. And also allow that the world you're building is not just a world that the story is in there and you have to go find it. So you can make the world building work for you. Hmm. you know? no, that's a great, great point. Um, okay. I think this one, this, this one's interesting. also uh, SFA SFC student, Danny Del Pico. Uh, Danny. How, Marlon, how do you feel about genre as a whole? You mm -hmm. started brief up. Uh, it right, just jumped away from me. You touched on it briefly in your discussion with Theo, how magic can be subjective depending on who mm -hmm. was reading it and in what time. To be more mm -hmm. specific, do you feel that fantasy, sci-fi, slash magical realism, although those are different genres, I think, uh, genre needs a certain formula or construct to make it work on the page slash screen. Mm -hmm. How do you appease the writer in, in you, the writer in you, and making mm -hmm. a story that is faithful to stories that have come before? That's a really good question. Yeah. Um... Can genre, this is because, you know, can, can genre be written in a way as to appease or appeal to the public? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think a lot of formula genre does that. And I think the, 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 the criticism a lot of people have about genre is that a lot of it is formula. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> I say, but a lot of literary fiction is formula. Um, you know, I don't care how many, how many, um, you know, just out of, just out of, um, just out of some writer's workshop right. writing about being a kid in a writer's workshop that Joyce Carol Oates is going to write a grave review of get a it's that's what that's a formula um I think though that it, it's it's you know I mean I'm not a genre snob mostly because I just couldn't afford it uh I um most of the books I read you know the only category I had for reading a book was that it was next <laughs> and whichever way I could find them, that's how I got them. And yeah, so that meant, you know, that meant reading 100 Years of Solitude. It meant reading The Railway Children. It meant reading Ancient Evenings, which was a trip. And right after Ancient Evenings, I read Hollywood Wives. And I will defend Jackie Collins to the death. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even being ironic. Um, listen, I read Hollywood Wives when I was 14. Don't do that. Um, and first book I read all through the night woke up you know, next morning I look in the mirror and I'm like I'm a man now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah it's 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 um I think you know it, the the the, um, the 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 first thing with genre so-called genre fiction is that if we're talking about genre fiction that sticks to the formula um um, oh God! What's his name? His, his pseudonym is Benjamin Black. He won the Booker as well. Really, oh, really good writer. Um, I can't remember his name. You think I remember since he's a great writer? John Banville. And John Banville writes detective novels under Benjamin Black. And the thing interesting about Benjamin Black is that he's not interested in innovating. Hmm. They're fully formula. And I, he, and I get the feeling he just loves it because it gives him some way to have fun but they're fully within the genre. So can there be genre fiction that plays a certain formula to appeal to a certain crowd? Of course. And there are certain readers who that's what they're there for. 
they're like, no, this is what I want. I want, I want dead woman in the ditch. I want the, the alcoholic detective. I want him to get too close to the case and it jeopardizes his career. I want him to save everybody, but he's emotionally damaged at the end so we can get to the next book. Any Unesbo fans out there? Because I love Unesbo. Yeah. Um, but there are also people who have always messed with that format. And a lot of more famous or the more enduring novels of these so-called genre aren't messed with it so much that it, it goes beyond that. Like anytime Richard Price writes a book. You know, or, you know, um, it's, I think it's because we have this genre snobbery that both Faulkner and Hemingway got away with ripping off Raymond Chandler. Mm -hmm. They both ripped him off wholesale and they both got away with it. Because, of course, who's going to believe that? He's I mean, Hemingway. We got a ton from Hammett, too. Yeah, Hammett, actually. It's more Hammett, it's ha more Hammett than Chandler. Both of them steal from Dashiell Hammett. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, they, 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 they really run their own point. I'm getting at is, regardless of 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 what we think of this genre, and I think people just write the best story they could write. And and you know, and um, how are you how are you surprising us? How are you how are you um, taking us into territory that we haven't gone before? The the the, la the worst thing you can think about with the so-called genre fiction is genre is a is a is a genre of shoulds. And I think that's the thing. We, we, we think, when we say genre, we think, oh, this is a genre of this, this, this should happen. And that's not how that works either. You know? and, 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 and the most memorable novels of these genres are always the ones where you didn't see that coming. It's one of the reasons why you know, I love Patricia Highsmith so much. Oh, yeah. You know, or Dorothy L. Sayers. Um, what was the book? Oh God, I'm trying to remember which Dorothy Sayers book I just reread. I don't know. I read so many books, I'm getting them confused. I'm old. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that I think is my very, very roundabout answer about genre. Okay, great. Um, let's see. We have a very specific question from uh, Boo Kassen. Uh, hi, Boo. Uh, also MFA student. Um, Marlon, in the excerpt you've read, if I didn't misunderstand you, you said that a 117-year-old witch is telling the story in third person when she was young. What's the benefit of that narrative structure? Why not just start the story at her young age? Um, well, one is the context of the novels. In the novels, all the characters are giving eyewitness testimony. And um, if you've read the, the, the previous novel, the person interrogating them always want, want to know about their childhood. And um, the previous narrator did exactly that. That, um, that did exactly what, um, you know, what, what um, uh, Vukasin, I think that's how you said it. Yeah, that, no, Vuki. No? Vuki. Vuki. Okay, Vuki. Yeah, and the other character did that. Where, why jump into the third person with a, as a kid? He just went back to being a kid. Um, Suglan, I think, is different largely because in their in one hundred seventy seven years, to think she has lived so many different lives as different people, mm. and there is a certain kind of emotional disconnect with her that will be that will become more apparent as the novel goes on. That even though it's about her, it seems to be all these different people kind of telling her story, mm. and there are reasons there are reasons you know there are reasons for that. Um, but I think for her um, to talk about these things, she has to distance herself. There's this, um, this is great album by, from PJ Harvey called, um, called um, Is This Desire? And PJ Harvey's breakup albums are really interesting or post-relationship albums are interesting because usually the way she explores the trauma is inventing these female archetypes. So all this, almost so many of the songs have different women's names like a perfect day elise catherine um joy these all these women taking up these roles to explore the this sort of um post breakup damage and i also thought that was interesting somebody thinking that the only way i can explore this is to create to create other people who will be me mm. and i think that's kind of what um, the character is doing here. Hmm. That's really, 
really interesting. Um, mm. Also, the, the implications of being that old and how the distance from life sounds like a really fascinating kind of point of view. Mm -hmm. Sort of rolls into this question up here, um, how you answered it. A question, uh, how does this question of writing the quote unquote other work in terms of reaching into others' traumas? I'm a mm -hmm. hurricane Maria survivor and I find myself uncomfortable with the way other artists have recently started using Maria as a plot point without actually knowing what they're talking about or tackling the issue fully. Sorry, a what survivor? You, you came out, you, you, it, Hurricane Maria. Right. Um, ah. Says, I think it has me overly paranoid on delving into other people's experiences in that way, both traumas and just normal lived experiences. Mm -hmm. I think you've answered this question, but any advice on how to quote unquote observe without paranoia um you mean observe observe the how people write about it or observe as a reader? i think observe as a writer uh observing people um people other people's traumas um them, i guess without right having... no that's interesting because because you can you can make a pornography out of trauma yeah um, you know, and I think it's, 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 um, uh, it's, 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 it's a lot of things that play here. Um, one is subtlety, which may shock some people given how explicit I write. I think I'm pretty subtle. Um, it's, it's ultimately, you know, um, so we're writing about an, a traumatic event that happened or could, or could have happened. You, you, you can't we can't lose sight of the fact that these are people who are going through this and that these are people who had a pre-trauma and a post-trauma life and i think sometimes with these stories we don't get a sense of that um it's a dilemma for example writing about um rape that's why i may destroy you the tv show is really interesting there's never been anything quite like it because you know um michaela talks about it as a survivor herself she talks about there seem to be only two types of stories with this on TV. Um, rape victim who's only a rape victim. Mm. Unbelievably, it's a great show. But those characters weren't anything. They didn't make, make the characters a bit more than that. But the problem when we try to make women who have gone through trauma more than that, the writer, if the writer isn't good enough, and most of them are not good enough, it starts to add up to, here is how her behavior caused this. Mm. And a lot of writers even realize that's what they're doing. They're like, oh, I'm just recounting. And they said, no, dude. Yeah. You're going, here are the ways in which this, what she did led to this. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's those two things, a tricky balance you have to hit, but you have to hit it. Mm -hmm. And you have to risk failing, falling flat on your face, um, doing it. Um, but I think it's, it's that. It's, it's, it's um, you know, and, 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 and trauma that people inflict on each other is not the same as trauma of a, national, a, a natural disaster. They're not the same thing. But what I think we do sometimes is that even when we're not really trying to, when we're really trying to do our best by these characters, we end up dehumanizing them. Um, we think, okay, they're known for losing two legs. They are no longer complicated. You know, I know lots of people who lost all limbs and are still going to vote for Trump. <laughs> you know, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, it, that's a complicated character. You know, and I think that's it. I think um, even when we're, when, we're, when we're writing about events where characters are going through immense stress, trauma, attack, whatever, it can be, we have to remember that, that these characters are, are, you know, had a pre-event life and are going to have a post-event life. And we have to get a sense of both. Or we're just thinking you're just writing, you're just writing um, plot points in your trauma porn. Well, it's, it's interesting also to define the tendency to define the pre-trauma life around the trauma that didn't happen yet. Mm-hmm kind of interesting and it's sort of like, it's no no room for that for that mm -hmm. to have a complexity which is why i think i may destroy you is really interesting um because yeah it talks about she honestly she she, she does have a drinking problem and 
like a lot of, of, of British people who party and play, yeah, drink and take some MDMA and such and such. And, 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 and a lot of, you know, if you just be around London at 5 p.m., you see what I'm talking about. People get trashed. And she's not ignoring that. But she's also pointing out how her friends didn't help her. She's pointing out that, that if you see your friend behaving in a way or your friend, you know, in a way that they cannot make decisions, you can't just leave them there and hope it's going to all pan out and call yourself a good friend. Yeah. So she goes into that as well. And it's really, it's really interesting, you know, what she's doing. And some of the shows jump 10 years before anything happened. And some jump, you know, to other characters. It's really interesting what's going on in that show. It, to me, to me, it plays like a novel. Oh man. Okay, I think we're gonna we're gonna start to to wrap up. Thanks. I want to one more one more question out here about process. How do you solve writer's block during the writing process? I've had I've been working on a novel for the past year, and I've had writer's block that entire time. And this is from Danya, Danya, uh, another MFA student. Um, um, wow, writers. He wrote a novel over a year, but, but blocked mm. the whole time. Maybe blocked is working, I don't know. Hold on, so writing a novel unblocked or haven't written anything in a year? Um, how do you solve writer's block during the writing process? I've been writing on a novel, working on a novel for the past year. And oh, I've working off, right, okay. Um, hmm. I, you know, God, it's, it's, the thing is, there's no one, one, one way of, of solving writer's block. We're all such different people and different writers. I know a lot of people who solve writer's block. Well, I know some people who don't even believe in writer's block. Um, I know some people who solve it by just reading and reading what they wouldn't read before. And by that, I don't mean, you know, if you're a dude, I'm going to read a novel by a woman. Well, you should. But, um, Sometimes it's, it's, I remember once, and the guy, I don't remember, what was he writing? And I said, you need to read Teresa of Avila. I was like, who's that? It's like, it's a nun writing all these devotionals to Jesus. It's like, why the hell would you have me read that? I said, read it. And he read it. I was like, wow, I completely didn't expect anything like that. It's something absolutely unlike anything he's ever written, read. And because... The, the experience of, of being in such a totally different way of, of telling something or, or conveying meaning should ultimately open up to different ways of telling a story. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and, and, that's, and, 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 and sometimes that's what you need to read something that you would never have read. And, it, and I don't mean read a different kind of novel. Sometimes it means reading something else. Um, you know, poetry unlocks me every morning. So, <laughs> and... I wrote one poem in my entire life and thank, hopefully no human will ever see it. Um, I think so. Reading is one thing. I think sometimes writing something else. Yeah. Um, every writer at this point have the drawer of the half finished book or the one third finished book. Some of them you'll go back to some books, even though you start them, it's not their time. Um, sometimes the best way to, 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 to um, refresh that story is to start a different one. And you may go back to it, or you may realize that those stories work together, or you may realize that, no, this is what I want to do. Because sometimes, you know, you can write 400 pages and all that service will lead you to this brand new page 500. And that's where your book begins. And I think some people, that's their process. Sometimes it's, it's writing can be like driving in the dark. You know, it's like, um, you don't know where you're going, but if you keep going, you'll get there. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, for when, 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 you know, when that happens and we're blocked, sometimes that is it. It can also mean, and I was saying this to somebody, um, I think I was saying to somebody in the class before, um, that sometimes it may also mean retelling the story from somebody else's point of view. A lot of times, you know, point of view is so... It's funny, we talk about it all the time, and yet it's, so under, it's still so underrated when we talk about um, literature, about point of view. Hmm. That point of view, and with point of view, degree of distance can completely change how you tell a story. What do I mean by point of view and degree of distance? Point of view, of course, meaning that um, 
maybe what you need is maybe what's needed is a first person narrative or a third person narrative mm -hmm. or if you if you're feeling really daring a second person narrative what may what what you may need is um a different character telling the story what you may need is a different degree of distance um Sometimes I have my students go, why don't you rewrite it in an objective point of view? Meaning if people can't see it, smell it, smell it, touch it, or taste it, you can't write it. Mm. That means no more he thought to himself that blah, blah, blah. That can't happen anymore. Lock, lock everybody's minds off mm. and then write. Mm. Hemingway did that quite a bit. He, to the point where people didn't even realize when he breaks his own rule, but he breaks it quite a bit. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's a point of view problem, or not even a problem. I hate using the word problem. It's sometimes it's a point. It's it's looking at point of view that can put you can take you out of that. Um, I was blocked. I, I don't like the word blocked. Let's say stunted. Actually, that sounds worse than blocked. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, challenged. Challenged with my second novel, Book of Night Woman, and. Um, at some point, I decided a character showed up, a character named Lilith, and she showed up. And it was in third person, and um, she was working in a bar. And I think, because I didn't know where to go, I just went, you know, why don't I write a chapter from this character's point of view? No other reason other than she was there. Um, yeah, and, you know, what happened, you know, what happened was, um, yeah, it's, it's, it just, the story just exploded. You know, the story just, it, that's what I needed and I didn't know. And I actually fought it for a while. I'm like, that's not how I want to tell a story. Um, but yeah, sometimes it's switching, it's switching stuff around and switching the characters around, switching point of view and realize maybe what this story needs is not a new story, but new eyes telling it. Mm, that's really good advice. Um, all right, guys. So I think we're going to, wrap it up, call it a day. Um, Marlon, I want to thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, yeah, I better thank Max or he's going to bark. Yeah, well, he was better. Marlon also, he did, he just, just so everyone, uh, Marlon actually did a craft talk exclusively for MFA students earlier this week. So this is our follow-up, uh, open to the public. And both were absolutely opening and inspiring, just speaking for me personally. Um, but, uh, uh, any, t every time, anytime it's a, it's a true pleasure and a true honor. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll talk about, you know, coming back around and hopefully maybe even in person back in Brooklyn. Oh my uh, God. Talk about speculative evictions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, looking forward to that next, the, the next book. When does it have a pub date? Why are, why are you trying to intimidate me? <laughs> uh, it'll, it'll come out perfectly. someday. <laughs> okay, guys, this was so great. Thank you guys for showing up. It's a great Saturday afternoon. I'm going to go try avoid Lyme disease today. Um, yeah, best of luck out there. <laughs> okay, guys. All right, I'm going to end for all. Okay, all. Bye. Take care.